In this section, we're going to continue our discussion about limits as x approaches infinity or negative infinity. In limits number three, we focused on rational functions. And in this section, we're going to talk about non-rational functions. And we're also going to look at non-existent limits, those does not exist answers. And we're going to be able to be more specific with them. So we're going to be able to say, whether that limit is approaching infinity or negative infinity. DNE is just the catch-all for both of those situations. So we're gonna be able to be more specific with that. Let's take a look at how some other types of functions fall into the domination rules that we talked about in limits number three. So I have here, the most dominant function you're gonna come across is an exponential function. This e to the x is a popular one, but it could actually be any base. That you want. What makes an exponential function exponential is the fact that the variable is in the exponent position. And if you look at a graph of an exponential function, it rises very sharply at the end. So it starts, you know, somewhat like this, and then at the end it rises very sharply. So it will dominate anything that it's paired with. A power function has the variable as the base. So when I have something like x to a number that is a power function and that's what we dealt with in limits number three and the least dominant function would be your logarithmic function in algebra 2 we discovered that the natural log function was the inverse of this exponential function so whereas the exponential function rises very sharply at the end the natural log function does exactly the opposite as I draw a natural log function, it's going to peter out at the end and look something like this. So whichever type of function is placed against a logarithm function, whether it is a power function or an exponential function, will eventually overtake it at the end. Let's take a look at a few examples here to make sure that you can apply this correctly. But before we do, let's recall the dominant term rules that we had from limits number three. If you have a dominant numerator, that means the limit does not exist. And one way we said you can remember that is dominant numerator, dn, and then you've got the dne right here. If you have a dominant denominator, that means the limit as x approaches infinity was zero. And if it's a tie, if you have a dominant term in the numerator and denominator, then you just make a fraction out of the coefficients. So it's all about identifying the dominant term and just seeing where it is. So let's take a look at this first example. And it is a limit as x approaches infinity, so I know I'm going to apply my dominant term rules. And I just take a look and I see up here I have an exponential function because the variable is in the exponent position. Down here I have a power function because the variable is the base of the exponent. And so 2 to the x is my dominant term. It lies in the numerator, and when your dominant term is in the numerator, this is a DNE. So my answer to number 1 is DNE. In example number two, it's really tempting to take a look at this and see, oh, x to 100. Wow, that's really big. That's going to dominate. But keep in mind that an exponential, this guy down here, it's going to dominate any sort of a power function that it's paired with. So my dominant function is actually this e to the x. And when I look back at these dominant term rules, I know if I have a dominant denominator, then my limit is going to equal 0. So my answer to number two is going to be zero. In question number three, in the numerator, the only thing I'm concerned with is this x to the 72. That log doesn't do anything, doesn't contribute anything. So that's got nothing to do with anything. And the lower power down here. So really, I'm comparing these two, the x to the 72 and the x to the 70. And the 72 is the larger power. So again, I have a dominant numerator on this one. So this is a d and e. In question number four, I have a log function paired with a power function. It's irrelevant that the power on that log function is the fifth. All that matters is it's a natural log. It is the least dominant of the bunch. So my dominant term is actually this x to the 0 0.02 that's in my denominator. So again, I have a dominant denominator, 
which means my limit as x approaches infinity is going to be zero. Question five is a little tricky because I have that e to the negative x. So I'm gonna apply the negative exponent and I'm gonna think of this as being the natural log of x over e to the x. And when I write it in that form, I can see that my dominant term is in the denominator. So this is a dominant denominator, which means dominant denominator means that zero is my answer for this one. So number five is a zero. For question number six, you just have to make sure you look at all the terms in the numerator and denominator, because it's really tempting to look here and see a match with those and think the answer is one third. However, this x to the 24th isn't even gonna show up when it's paired with that e to the x. So this isn't gonna do anything. So I really need to pay attention to the e to the x and it's gonna dominate everything. So again, a dominant numerator is gonna give me an answer of d and e. In this next part, I would like to look at what infinite limits look like graphically. So in this first one, as x approaches negative infinity, y is going to be approaching infinity. In other words, as I move to the left, my graph is going to be moving up. The y's are going to be increasing. So as I go to the left, we're going to take an upward turn. On the next one, as x approaches infinity, y is going to be approaching infinity. So as I move to the right, the y's are going to be increasing or going up. So this graph would look something like this, pointing up at the right end. And as x approaches negative infinity, my y's are approaching negative infinity. As I move left, x is approaching negative infinity, and y will approach negative infinity as well and take a downward turn. And on the last one, as x approaches infinity, my y's would be approaching negative infinity. So as I move to the right, the y's would be moving down, would be decreasing. So as I move to the right, we would be pointing downward like this. Let's take a look at a few examples. In this next part, we're given four limits to evaluate, and in each one of these limits, it does not exist. So each one of these limits has a dominant numerator. But instead of just saying DNE is our answer, we're gonna get more precise. We're gonna give a more specific answer, and we're gonna say whether that non-existent limit means my graph approaches infinity or negative infinity. And the way that we're gonna do that is, first we're gonna identify the dominant terms in the numerator and denominator. We're gonna simplify it algebraically, and then we're gonna plug in a representative number, either a really big number or a really small number, and analyze what's happening. So in number seven, I'm gonna identify my dominant terms in the numerator and denominator, and I'm gonna simplify this algebraically to three x. I brought a graph in so you'd have a better understanding of what we're doing and why we're able to do it. What you see graphed here in blue, this is my original rational expression this guy. And what you see graphed here in red is the graph of 3x, which is what I got when I simplified this. And what I want you to see is if I just kind of block out the middle part of this graph, those two graphs look the same. So these terms right here that I'm ignoring, they only affect the function early on in the graph. But when we're speaking of end behavior, this function is gonna behave exactly as the function of 3x. And that's why we're allowed to simplify it to 3x and why we're doing what we're doing actually works. So now I'm gonna take a large number and replace x with a large number. And if you think of three times a big number, you will get a positive number. So my answer here is infinity. Go ahead and pause the video and try eight, nine, and 10 using the same method. So identify your dominant terms, simplify, and then imagine either a large positive or negative number sub substituting in for the x and just see if you get a positive or a negative. So on question eight, I first of all pull out my dominant terms and I simplify this into 3x. And then I imagine a really big negative number, I guess that'd be a really small number, plugging in for the x and three times a negative number would be negative infinity. On number nine, 
Again, here are my dominant terms. That simplifies into negative x. And if I take a positive infinity and I put it in here, I get negative big number, which would be a negative infinity, so that's my answer. And then in number 10, I look at my dominant terms, 2x to the fourth over negative x squared. That simplifies into negative 2x squared. I imagine a negative number plugging in to the x. So I have negative 2, a negative number squared. When I square a negative, it's going to turn positive. So this is actually negative 2 times a positive big number, which turns it back to negative. So the answer here is negative infinity. In this next section, we talk about the possibility of a function having two horizontal asymptotes. Up until now, we've been looking at rational functions, which have at most one horizontal asymptote. But there are some functions that have two different horizontal asymptotes. And you have an example of one here on the right. So you can see as I move to the right, I have a horizontal asymptote of 1. But as x approaches negative infinity, I'm approaching a horizontal asymptote of negative 3. I also want to call your attention to a common misconception with horizontal asymptotes. So a lot of people think, oh, horizontal asymptote, this graph will never equal 1. This graph will never have a y value of 1. However, it actually does. If you look at right here, when x is 1, and if I plug a 1 in for all these x's, I'm going to get a y value of 1. So this graph actually passes through the point 1, 1. So this graph does actually equal its horizontal asymptote value. A horizontal asymptote addresses what happens at the far end of the graph. It doesn't care what happens early on. So the fact that I hit that horizontal asymptote value right here is irrelevant. As I move to the right and as x grows without bound and increases, then I'm going to be settling on that horizontal asymptote value. Our goal for this part is going to be, how are we going to find these horizontal asymptotes when we're not looking at a graph? So we're going to learn how to do it analytically. And the first thing we need to do is consider two horizontal asymptotes. So the limit as x approaches infinity and the limit as x approaches negative infinity. And we're going to take on pretty much the same technique that we did on the problems above. So I'm going to imagine a really big number being plugged in for the x as x is approaching infinity. So all these x's I've replaced with just some big number because x is approaching infinity. And I can ignore these terms that aren't going to contribute anything. And then I just simplify from there. So this numerator is going to stay the same. So 3 times some big number. And in the denominator, I've got a big number plus. Now when I go to do the square root of 4, that's going to bring me to 2. So we'll see a 2 here. And the square root of a big number squared is just that big number. And now I just simplify this even further. So down here, I can pull this together. And I can call that 3 times a big number. And these big numbers are just going to wipe each other out. And I'm just left with 3 over 3, and that simplifies to 1. And I can see in my graph that that matches my horizontal asymptote as x approaches infinity. I'll use that same method on the second problem, except this time I'm going to be substituting in a really big negative number. My first step was to replace all of my x's with a negative big number. And now I'm going to simplify from here. And I'm going to disregard the terms that aren't going to make a difference. So I'm only going to pay attention to the dominant terms in the numerator and the denominator. So here, 3 times a negative big number is going to give me a negative 3 times that big number. And then here, negative big will just be negative big. And right here, if I take a negative number and square it, it's going to eat that negative. So what I see up here right here is actually 4 times that big number squared. So now this becomes negative 3 times a big number over a negative big number plus 2 
times the big number because when I square root the four big numbers squared, I get two big. And I'm just working with this algebraically. This becomes negative three times that big number over a negative one and a plus two is gonna leave a one times the big number. And just imagine these canceling out and I am just left with a negative three. And you can see when I look to the left up here, as x approaches negative infinity, I am approaching a horizontal asymptote, a y value of negative three. And I just confirmed that here. These can get a little tricky, so go ahead and try the next examples and make sure you got the hang of it. So the first thing I did was I imagined a large number being plugged in for the x's, and I also disregarded this minus x. I'm just focusing on the dominant terms. And then I simplified the square root of 9 big number to the 6th power became 3 times big number to the 3rd power. The denominator stayed the same. And now I can just cross these out. And my final answer on this one is going to be 3. On number 12, I replaced the x's with a negative big number because we are approaching negative infinity. And I only am paying attention to the dominant terms of the numerator and denominator, so those aren't going to matter. And now if I take a negative number to the sixth power, it's going to eat that negative, but a negative number to an odd power, the negative is going to show up. So now this is going to become a positive big to the sixth power. This negative is going to show up here. And then I square root nine big to the sixth, I get this. And then those big numbers are just going to cross each other out and I'm left with a 3 over a negative 1, so my answer here is going to be negative 3. In number 13, if you replace the x's with a big number, a big number times e to a big number is just going to grow indefinitely, so my answer here is infinity. And you can also relate this to dominant term rules as well. So I have a dominant numerator, so infinity is the same thing as saying DNE. So you could look at it either way. And then on number 14, if I have a negative big number times e to a negative big number, I'm going to take care of that negative exponent right here, and I'm going to put it down in the denominator. So it's going to say negative big over e to the big. And now what I've got is a dominant denominator here, because my dominant term is in the denominator because that exponential is going to dominate everything. So I have a dominant denominator, which means my answer here would simply be zero. These questions can be a little tricky, a little confusing. So um, do the best you can in Delta Math. And if we need to do more examples or a further discussion in class, we'd be happy to do that.